Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, today, Amrita and I are going to share everything we know about the banded leaf monkeys in Singapore to the best of our knowledge. Okay, so I will start off by providing some background information about this species in Singapore based on some of the research I've done during the masters like what Carrie was saying. And then Amrita will talk about her PhD research and I will finish it with some of the future directions uh, for the conservation of this species, which is already in the pipeline. Okay, so banded leaf monkey. Up to 1920s, it is still considered to be pretty common in Singapore. They can be found throughout the island, places like Tuas and Tempes. So it's pretty widespread. But up to 1980s, uh, as the urban development intensified, their numbers declined tremendously, such that they were only found in two nature reserves, Central Catchment and Bukit Tee. And then sometime uh, at this period, there was the construction of the Bukit Timah Expressway, which effectively cuts the two nature reserves. Uh, and the populations of the banded leaf monkey became isolated from each other. And in 1987, the last banded leaf monkey in Bukit Timah was killed by a dog when it came down the trees. And this is the specimen in the museum now. Uh, at this point up to now, the banded leaf monkeys are only found in central catchment. Okay? So then there was no research or official surveys on the banded leaf monkeys until 1994 uh, by a master's student uh, in NUS. Um, the unfortunate thing is the fieldwork was only six months and because it was really difficult to see the monkeys, um, he saw uh, the monkeys 13 times and it's not good enough to provide a population estimate but he tried. So he said that there are fewer than 20 individuals left. And then I follow up with my research and Amrita's research. Okay, so one of the reasons that it's so difficult to do research on the monkeys is because they're very shy, elusive, and sometimes when they see you, first they will run away. So it took me two months to have my first sighting, and this sub-adult banded leaf monkey is curious enough to stay and watch me for a while, while family group behind him was trying to run away from me. So this is typical of a sighting in the early phases of the survey. So they will see you, they will say maybe 10 seconds to 30 seconds at most. So I spent another few months to habituate them and finally, one day, I saw that they didn't run away. So they started to stay around, hang out with me. Um, but this is difficult to achieve because usually they're very shy and they're high up in the canopy. So at this point, it was at Upper Salita Reservoir Park. And I was lying on the ground, filming them. Joggers were running around and then I'm like, what is this strange girl doing? But okay, after about a year of trying to habituate them, then I can start to collect data that's meaningful. Not like five seconds of them looking at me running away. Okay, so for the next one to two years, I have uh, I collected data, and these are some of the questions that I'm interested to answer. So first of all, what's the population size? And I found that there are at least 40 individuals in five groups in the Central Catchment Nature Reserve. And then there are at least nine births with one season in June and July. So if you look at this picture, the banded leaf monkey is black in colour, but the infants, they are born white in colour. So if this picture you can see more clearly, the body is not entirely white. There are black fur, there's black fur which is on the tail and also across um, the body. So this is a picture that was taken by Ding Li in Kanti Reserve in Malaysia. That was a changeable hawk eagle preying on the infant. Just it looks like the tail. Yes. Uh, so, part of the bad drawing, but this is how it looks like. So it's born white, but there is a black color across the shoulder and also down the fur. Okay, so if you look at this number, 40 individuals, you would think that, oh, the population has increased in its numbers. 
but I wouldn't be too sure because it's hard to compare between the two study, one in 1994 and one in uh, 2011. So I'm just going to keep it as it is, 40 individuals during this time. And the next question is, what do they eat? So based on few observations, uh, which are very difficult to um, do, I recorded 27 plant species and it's really diverse, coming from 20 families. If you look closely, um, so some of the common ones you will recognize is rubber tree, there's also the bats laurel, angsana, and also tombusu. They feed on leaves, but also uh, fruits and other plant parts. And something interesting that you would uh, notice is that for the conservation status of the plants in Singapore, about half of these plant species are threatened. So they are either vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. And there is one that is presumed extinct until its rediscovery. So not only monkeys are endangered, but the plants that they feed on are also threatened in Singapore. Okay, so there are three subspecies of banded leaf monkeys, and the ones that we have in Singapore is the Prospidus femoralis femoralis. So in uh, taxonomic references, it is known to be found in Singapore and Johor. But uh, there were speculations that the Singapore and Johor populations are different species or subspecies based on morphology. So um, the monkeys in Johor they are darker and slightly bigger. But this is just based on morphology. We don't have any genetic data. Which is why the next question I was interested to answer was that are the populations in Singapore and Johor the same subspecies? And how do you get information? You can get DNA from blood, but that will be really intense. You have to shoot the monkey, draw the blood. You're not going to do that. You can also get uh, DNA from fur, but it's the same procedure. You need to shoot the monkey, get the fur from them. Um, the non-invasive way to get DNA is to shape. So this is how the shape of a monkey looks like. It's really fresh. So you can um, extract DNA from the fecal samples and learn a lot more about uh, what they eat, parasites and everything, and that will be what I'm just going to talk about. So for my part, I was looking at the DNA sequences from the populations in Singapore and also from Johor to make a comparison. So the answer is yes, they are the same subspecies. This is based on two genetic markers in the mitochondrial genome. So one marker shows that um, the sequences from Malaysia and Singapore, they are completely identical. So there's no difference at all. You can't tell whether it's from Singapore or Malaysia. Another genetic marker shows that there's only very small difference between the sequences. And so what you see in the fur color um, difference and also the size difference is probably just population variation. It's not sufficient to say that it's different subspecies. And the last question uh, that I was interested to answer is that um, since we have such a small population of banded leaf monkeys, 40 individuals, is it likely that they are inbred? And how do you examine that? So again, using fecal samples, we extracted DNA and compared uh, the sequences. So we sample about 20% of the population. We compared them and we found that there are very small differences between them. So it is likely that they are inbred. But again, because this is only one genetic marker that we use, so this is just preliminary data. But it's a sign that they are probably inbred. Okay, so um, I will continue with uh, oh, yes. uh Hi, everybody. Please let me know if you can't hear me in the back. So as Andy mentioned, we had six samples, basically. <laughs> uh, six six of them, um, mainly because these monkeys are difficult to observe and get, getting any kind of sample, uh, samples is still difficult. I hope that what at the end of this I can show that these six are like a gold mine for us. Um, so why is studying fecal samples difficult? 
uh, this is one of our initial communications. I uh, fished it out. What Andy is trying to tell me right now is that this is uh, the the fecal samples uh, collected can be tricky to work with. So here's a, a, a issues you can often face. So for example, you see the animal defecate. You collect the sample an hour later, perhaps, and then by the time you come back, bring it to a storage condition in the uh, in the lab. It's quite, it's getting older, and DNA we uh, doesn't last very long in normal room temperature. Uh, samples might land in a swamp forest in a swampy patch. So you, if it goes into water, well, there's nothing we can do. But if it goes onto a leaf and never falls onto the ground, there's nothing we can do. Um, also, so initial work which she talked about could, took a while to get optimized because. Uh, to get, uh, you have to get many trials uh, to uh, actually get any kind of data, and this is because these samples have a lot of compounds uh, coming in, and they interfere with any kind of molecular work that's going on in the lab. And sometimes uh, we get news like this that the sample actually turned out to be a macaque. So, <laughs> well, uh, which is often the issue uh, when it comes to studying uh, primate samples in Singapore. Um, so. But why do we care? Fecal samples are interesting because they have many different types of DNA. You have the DNA of the monkey. You have the DNA from the various plants it might be feeding on. You may, you may have the DNA from the various gut parasites that can be in the uh, uh, primate's gut. You have also the bacterial DNA. So if you manage to actually characterize the fecal samples, you can act, get a lot of uh, different types of information. But the reality is to study anything like this, you need, uh, you need to get data from everything, basically. Why can we do this today? Well, uh, there we are getting these technologies, which are called next generation sequencing technologies. These are what uh, give you like human genomes. For example, today people are talking about thousand dollar genomes. You can actually uh, sequence um, uh, and find out what potential disease, this, uh, disease risks you might be facing. And the reason this whole technology has been possible is because the cost of sequencing has uh, declined. So you can see here, now Moore's law is a law which people usually normally um, use to get an idea whether uh, a technology is working well. Now if a, if a technology is working well, uh, it should be following this particular trend that, okay, that's great sign that this particular technology should uh, should be in the market for a couple of years. DNA sequencing, on the other hand, has even defied that law. So it, the cost of sequencing has come down since about 2007 or 8 to now you having uh, nearly a billion base pairs, billion base pairs of DNA getting sequenced for something like $7. Uh, so this is what's making your human genome possible. But this comes with its issues uh, because let's say if you imagine this as, uh, take it as an analogy for a puzzle that you're trying to solve. The reality is what you're left with in a fecal sample is bits and pieces of it. You don't have everything. And you now want to sort out what is what here based on some sort of database that you might be having. So we need to find out that, OK, this fragment is monkeys. This fragment is plants. This is a number two area uh, of parasites that might be affecting it. So when we sequence this, so you are uh, taking these pieces, you sequence it, and you can get basically something like DNA fragments over here. And what you can, uh, when we sequence it, we call it uh, metagenomics. Basically, it's a complex sample getting sequenced. Multiple genomes are present here. And what we did was to sequence a lot of data from each of these samples. So this was our data set. Basically, each of the six samples together providing something like a 172 billion base pairs of information. So the next task is really, let's sort this out. Uh, <laughs> One way, let's take the puzzle analogy further. So if you have a sample uh, sequence here, uh, and you have a reference image, for example, what we can do is to take, 
pieces start matching it to the reference image. And this, in terms of DNA, starts looking like something like this. So you have a sequence in a database. You take your unknown sequence, you try to match it. Now this is a case where the sequence is perfectly identical. Okay, great. So we, if this is a, se a sequence of a known plant species, um, and we have an unknown sequence here, we can say that okay, this sequence is likely to belong to this plant species. But that's not what's happening in nature. You have genetic variation. So normally you will see something like this, where you have some sort of a mismatch uh, uh, happening because just a different, uh, uh, there is genetic difference even within a particular species. But there are cases where you can pretty much not match them at all. So this is a case where nothing's similar. And the reality is you will never be able to match something like so you, if we want to, want to see what kind of parameters and things like that, we want to be able to match our data. We want to know what is a good way, what, what gives us accurate answers here. So we took a particular case of Duke Landers in Singapore Zoo. So what we did was uh, went to the zoo, uh, collaborated with the zoo and uh, uh, we knew the diet of these particular animals. So they, they were known to feed on 16 different uh, plant species. And the question was firstly, do we get any kind of plant signal in their fecal samples? And yes, we found that we could recover the diet, at least more, more than 50% of the diet could be recovered. And then how do we actually identify the plants in that uh, particular, uh, in, the, in the fecal samples accurately? What we developed was that any kind of sequence similarity. So earlier I showed you some sort of uh, 100 base person match. Now we found that something like 98% sequence similarity could give us good answers about what the plants were. And then there were some other criteria that these many, at least these many nucleotides or base, bases have to be there. But we also found something interesting. So when you were looking at the uh, Duke Salvia, one of the big questions came, hey, I see a chicken sequence in there. Why is there a chicken sequence? And then we went back to the zoo and apparently they were fee uh, being fed rice balls with chicken inside them. So you can actually quite come to quite surprising <laughs> results uh, uh, with uh, metagenomics. And that's really the power of this technique, that it's not just that we, can, we are sequencing plants, we are sequencing everything here. Yeah? It's a matter of what you can fish out from the data. So we started applying them to the Andes uh, six samples here, and found a large number of plants that they were feeding on. Six, uh, so all the six samples contain two of the species, uh, which included the bats laurel, as well as this particular um, uh, liana that's very prevalent in the forest. Then you had several that were present in four samples, and then three, two, including, oops, sorry, uh, including Artocarpus, this is rubber. Yeah, if you remember, Andy observed rubber, and in, uh, she observed them actually twice feeding on them twice, so uh, they were uh, present four times here. Uh, you, we also found figs, uh, passion flowers, uh, and several others. And then there were things that were found in only single samples. And these were Andy's identification, so if we start ma matching the ones that Andy observed, so she observed 27 plant species, 15 of them uh, could be matched with the data that was coming from uh, metagenomics. Meta what you could can see is that on top here, the more frequent uh, uh, the uh, plants occur in fecal samples, the more often does she observe. So it's, it's a good validation for the technique, basically that anything that uh, is showing up more often in fecal samples is also more likely to get observed in the field. She also observed um, about, I think, um, 12 other identification uh, plants that were uh, not in the fecal samples. So you have metagenomics gave us about uh, 53 different plant identifications. Field observational data had 27. So today we have 63 plants that were uh, that we know to be diet of the monkeys. 
and we know that genetic analysis correlates well with observational data. So you can classify plants at different levels. You can talk about what genus they are in, what family they are in, and um, uh, we we get quite a bit of congruence between just use, just using six samples. But the big question is why should we care? So uh, why why characterize this diet and what what why is it so important? Well. We know that food availability can be limited in population, uh, limiting factor for population growth. Um, thankfully, the good news about banana leaf monkeys is that they seem to be eating a lot of different plants. Um, the, but it could also be that they need a lot of different plants. So if, the, uh, if they do actually need a diverse diet, the, uh, it is important that the habitat is kept intact. Secondly, if with the construction of EcoLink, if there's any possibility of uh, the primates going to uh, Bukitima Nature Reserve, we, that habitat can be made more suitable for the current population. Um, and if there are new nature parks getting uh, formed, you can talk about how do you really reforest these particular plant, uh, forest, uh, nature parks. So that was the plant identification. But like I said, fecal samples are different types of data. You can start looking at the personal analogy again. And what we can do is to start joining them. Let's say you didn't have the reference image. You can start joining them. And this is really how you construct your genomes. So we start linking the various sequences and do it, uh, uh, by shifting in a sliding window kind of a manner. And what you can get is now the entire mitochondrial genome. So as Andy was mentioning, previously we were talking about a genetic marker here. And we can now both validate and uh, see what's happening in the entire genome. And see whether the population genetic conclusions previously change with more data. So we have six new mitochondrial genomes. And what we find is that we have only three uh, additional variable sites. So we found one here. and then. One, two here. Basically, suggest, this is very low for a population. If you uh, look at macaques in Singapore, um, there uh, we find something like 14 variable uh, sites in the, simply the D group uh, in one population. And then if you have something like uh, proboscis monkey, a single population in uh, Indonesia can have up to 22 variable sites. And this is merely in this particular region. So something like three across the entire mitochondrial genome is quite low. So our conclusion is still it's low genetic variability and uh, it's highly likely to be impaired. What else? So similar to plants, we can start looking at other types of data. So we can talk about parasites. And this is a genetic marker we use for parasite analysis. And we find well, four different types of parasites here. Uh, two of these are protists. Uh, they are commonly found even in humans. And what's interesting is we found a particular type of entamoeba, which is known specifically to colobine primates only. Um, we also have roundworms. And um, three of the samples have uh, roundworms here, and one sample has this particular, this particular species. We know that this one occurs in Malaysia. so. Uh, well, we have we have a suggestion that this might be affecting the population in Singapore. So the question is, when you have something like this, if if in future we are getting more fecal samples, it would be interesting to screen them and see uh, if they they are uh, infected with these parasites or not. And that would be uh, now we kind of have some targets to look at and what uh, what would be affecting the health of the population. So. This is where our current knowledge of biology of the species stands at. So Andy is going to come uh, back and talk a little more on how we see the conservation going ahead in future. So. All right, so up to this point, it's just a summary of all the information that we know about the Bennett Leaf monkeys in Singapore. What do we do with this information? Is there a need to conserve the Bennett Leaf monkeys? So if you need a reason, besides the fact that they are really cute, they are our national uh, natural heritage. So Prisvitis femoralis, the species, was the specimen, was first collected by Sir Stanford Raffles from Singapore. Um, and it was then described in 1838. 
which makes Singapore the type of locality for the species and subspecies. The banded leaf monkey is also facing high risk of extinction. So they have a very restricted distribution only in the Central Catchment Nature Preserve. They have a very small population, effectively it's just one big pop one population of 40 individuals. And we have seen that we have information to show that they are having low genetic diversity. So they are likely to be inbred. What happens when there is fights? What happens when there is a storm? How about the outbreak of disease? There is no doubt that the population will be wiped out. Hence, they are listed as critically endangered in the Singapore Red Data Book and it's also listed as endangered in IUCN. Another reason for conserving them, instead of a subspecies, we have preliminary data to show that they are likely a species of this one. So if you look at the map again, three subspecies, one from Singapore and Johor, another one from North uh, Malay Peninsula, which includes Myanmar and Thailand, and another one in East Central Sumatra. But all these are based on morphological uh, description. There's not much genetic data at all. So when we compare the sequences from Singapore and Johor with the available data from the North Malay Peninsula, there is a 10% difference between them. So um, to give you an idea of what this 10% means, in mammals, typically, between species, you see 5% difference. So now, between subspecies, supposedly, there's 10%. So are we convinced that they are subspecies? At least we are not sure that they are subspecies. So what do we need to do? We definitely need to have more samples from this population because uh, the point of uh, comparison was only based on one sample. So of course, are we sure about the conclusions that we arrived at? Not really. So we definitely need more samples from here and also from Sumatra to compare with the Singapore and Johor population to see if, we, if they are indeed uh, the same species or different species. So if they are indeed a different species, it means that they are even more threatened than is currently recognized. Okay, so um, this is something that I have been, we have been discussing with the authorities and other organizations like NPARCS and WES, WRS, Nature Society, and also Jane Goodall Institute to discuss what we can do to conserve the species. So one of the first objectives, which I think is very important, is to clarify the species status. So we definitely need to have more samples from the Robinson's banded leaf monkey and some of the places that they are found in are in uh, the nature reserves. Of course, there's not no studies at all on the leaf monkeys in Sumatra and also North Malay Peninsula. And also more samples from the East Sumatran banded leaf monkey. And so far, they're only known to occur in two nature reserves. So again, very restricted distribution. Second of all, we need to conserve the banded leaf monkey. And I think it's important to update the information uh, about the distribution and population size. Because after all, the information that we get on population size and di distribution is a couple of years uh, old. So at the moment, we believe that there are two main groups of the banded leaf monkeys in central catchment. The main group in Nisun Son Forest and another in Salita. So over at Nisun, there are probably four to five groups of them. And in Upper Salita, there's one to two groups of them. Also, in Mandai, because of a storm that occurred in 2011, Siva, me, and a couple of us, um, we saw two individuals over there. So in this uh, Mandai area, in this peninsula, it is not known to have been any monkeys. Perhaps because there's not enough surveys, we're not sure. But they are there. And then, more recently, um, Swaywi um, did a survey for his project, and he saw one to two individuals over there as well. But we're not sure if it's the same individuals or different. Also, there's one individual that was observed near the Chestnut Nature Reserve, uh, Nature Park. And this is the closest individual to the Ecolink. 
So there is a chance that we may start to cross to Bukit Timah. That would be a good news. Um, and also, we have the first road queue, which was in 2011, and it occurred on the Upper Thompson Road. So we believe that this juvenile was trying to cross between the two fragments, so from outside the nature reserve to within the Sun area. And because um, the arboreal canopy um, wasn't good enough for them to cross, they might be using the roads and hence the road queue. And even more recently, uh, Nick Baker and a couple of the Nature Society members saw four individuals of Benedict Monkey that's quite far away from the central catchment. So this is in the Tabo uh, Lentor Forest near the teacher's estate. And if you look closer, there's also four individuals at lower pits. So if I were to zoom in, this is how the forest looked like in Tabo, and this is uh, lower pits. So between here and here, there are buildings, there's roads, and it's about 800 meters apart. So are they the same individuals? Are they different individuals? We're not sure. Again, this is recent uh, data. The unfortunate thing is that this forest is going to be cut for development. So I believe Nature Society has a position paper to try to fight for a phased development if possible so that there can be some mature secondary forest that's preserved for the monkeys and other wildlife. So hopefully that can happen. Um, and then Nick Baker recently has a really good video of the banded leaf monkeys and the long tail mechanic. It's very rare to see banded leaf monkey and long tail macaque together because sometimes I was told that when you see the two species together, they will fight. But is it really the case? So actually, not really. Because some of the few times, I mean, it's really rare to see the two species together. But the few times that I've seen them, they are pretty okay with it. So basically ignoring each other. <laughs> There's a lot to learn about how the different species interact, and so you shouldn't always think that the monkeys, like the macaques, are aggressive towards the Benedict monkeys because they're typically shy and all, but not really. So for this video, it's pretty clear. Okay, so then I believe that in, in addition to having a population survey in Singapore, it's also necessary to survey the population in Johor. Because you're not concerned, I mean to me, it, it's not just conserving the species in Singapore, it's conserving the species as a whole. So in Johor, where are they located? So we know that they are present in Panti uh, Bird Sanctuary, which is in Kota Tinggi in Johor, also in Gunung Lombard, and also Balumo. But there are a couple of uh, protected areas that we do not know if they still occur because just historical record says that they are there, but there's no surveys unless you are there to see the monkeys. So there are a couple of places that I believe we need to survey in order to know the exact distribution and how threatened they are. And of course, there's a Tanjong Pi, which they are no longer uh, found in. And I propose to focus on one particular area to uh, have intensive surveys. And that is in Panti Bird Sanctuary. So has anyone been there before? It is a great place, not just for birds, but also for primates. So it's really rare to have one place where there are six primate species. That's quite a lot. So in addition to the banded leaf monkey, we have the dusky leaf monkey. So the ones with like white eye rings, really cute. And orange babies. We also have the white-handed gibbon, the greater slow loris, same species as Singapore. We have the long-tailed macaque and the southern pigtail macaque. So we have macaques, loris, gibbons, leaf monkeys. It's really diverse. And so um, when I was there in 2010 for a survey for Jim Goodall's Institute, just walking the main trail, every day I would see the banded leaf monkeys. One group at least, sometimes two. But again, that is in 2010. We do not know if it's still common there because this place is being locked as with every other places in Malaysia. So, population survey in Panti, in order to collect more information about the diet of the monkeys in Malaysia, how does it compare with Singapore? 
And also, what is the genetic diversity in Malaysia? Is it as inbred as the ones in Singapore? Or do you have high uh, genetic diversity? Which brings us to whether there is a need to maintain a captive colony in Singapore or Malaysia. Because after all, if we think about the population, the planet leaf monkey population in Singapore is inbred. There's a low uh, population size. Increasing the habitat, providing more food, wouldn't help with um, decreasing, with increasing the genetic diversity. So I know there have been talks about whether is it possible to perhaps get uh, banded leaf monkeys from rescue centers in Malaysia or the zoos, and maybe even from the wild. This is still in the discussion, but I think it is important to start thinking about it. Because not just Singapore, but in Malaysia, even if they have high genetic diversity, most of the forests over there are being logged, so they're not protected at all. And also, I think, lastly, um, within Singapore, we can do something about reconnecting the forest fragments. So if you remember, there was a road queue, and it was because it was trying to cross between the fragments. So some of the areas which I think is really important to consider for uh, whether it's a reforestation or connecting canopies are places like Mandai. So if you have been there before, some of the peninsulas are not connected at all. And that's where the monkeys are also uh, located. There's also this area linking to Serdita. Within Serdita, the place where there was the road queue, Within Old Upper Thompson Road, so if you have been there before, that's one of the main areas where the monkeys can be seen. So if you want to try to look for them, that's the place to go to. And then there is also this uh, Upper Thompson Road where it's linking between Lower Pierce and the Lantau Forest, which they're most recently seen. So um, that is all we have for today. Um, there's been discussions already ongoing, trying to secure funds to do more research. And these are the partners that uh, we're going to have. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask us.